Hi friends, how are you doing today? My name is Jessica from What I Have Learned and um, I blog at What I Have Learned and uh, do Facebook at What I Have Learned and Pinterest and all that kind of stuff at What I Have Learned and I'm here tonight to share with you about word problems and how to teach word problems by focusing on the content of the word problem and focusing on the problem type itself. Um, word problems are so hard for students and so um, I've sort of developed this strategy that I've used the past couple years with my kiddos and it really helps them uh, sort of dig deeper into the word problem. So I'm going to show you a couple of problems this evening, uh, but first just some background information on, um, on me in case you don't know who I am. Um, my name is Jessica, like I mentioned, and I um, blog at what I have learned. I've taught for 16 years in the classroom. I started my teaching career a long time ago at uh, fifth grade, went down to fourth grade, third grade, and then did four years out of the classroom working for um, a local university and working for um, a school district at their district office and decided that I missed the kids. I missed teaching. I miss um, getting into their brains and figuring out how they were learning and seeing those light bulb moments. And I missed planning and I missed um, I don't know, figuring out what makes learning fun for kids. So I decided to go back into the classroom and um, and taught kindergarten and then went up to uh, first grade and then second grade. And so um, most of my products in my store have to do with around second grade because that's where I was when I started creating them. And so um, this unit here I developed when I was teaching a one-two combo. And so it is applicable to first and second graders. Um, I have had people use it with kindergartners as well, so you just have to kind of adapt it a little bit for um, the kids that you, in your classroom of course, like anything that you have. Um, but my passion is um, teaching and learning and seeing kids learn and having those light bulb moments go off and having lessons that just sort of click with students and helping them see that they can be successful. So I love being able to um, do that with students. And in this particular um, in this particular Facebook Live, I'm going to show you how to work with word problems and take a look at how to teach students um, to read a word problem, how to look at the equation within a word problem, how to um, solve a word problem and different models and strategies they can use. Just as a big overview, I have a blog post about all of these word problems by problem type, and it is here. So this is how to just differentiate word problems, and it goes into the different problem types and about teaching the relationship of the numbers. In the blog post, you can click to get a free sample um, of a product, but it has, um, I think it's 12 different word problems. I can't quite remember exactly how many are in there. But this just talks about sort of the theory and the background knowledge behind what I'm going to show you today. What I'm actually going to show you today is working through some of the word problems that you see here and show you how I teach them to students themselves. Um, I've had a few people um, comment or ask questions of, how do you get started? How do you actually use these with students? So that's kind of what this post or this uh, Facebook Live, it's not really a blog post, but this Facebook Live is here to um, do is to show you how to use these with students and to make it um, accessible for them and, and help them um, learn these strategies for themselves. So what I have today um, and what I'm going to do over the next uh, four weeks is go through the four main problem types. There are um, four main problem types when you work through word problems. The first one is join problems. Um, the second one is um, separate problems. There's part, part, whole, and then compare problems. And each one of those I'll go a little bit more in depth with as um, as the weeks progress and we'll go in depth with each one. This first week is just on the join problems and to um, take a look at the three different type of join problems. Um, I don't know if it's this particular post or a different post where I have them kind of all laid out for you. Um, they're also in the Common Core Standards in the appendix and you can take a look at the graphic that's in there and it'll uh, make a grid um, that shows you um, how each of the problems sort of um, relate to one another. But today it's all about the join problems, and I have um, three problems. One's printed here, and I have two here. I will also show them on the screen so that you can see them. And what I'm going to do is just basically walk through how I um, 
work with students with them. So kind of like you were a class and I was up in front of them teaching them, kind of that's how it's gonna go. Um, but basically I um, shine the problem up on the projector. I don't have a projector at home to use, so I am um, ad limited and I printed it out, but obviously in a video form, it's not large enough for you. So I'll share the problem with you in a second. But I um, projected onto a um, board I use a whiteboard, but you can also use like a smart board or anything that you can write on as well because I tend to write all over the problem as we are working on it. Students will have the same problem in their journals. So each of my students has a math journal that they um, use daily as we work through this. And then we use the math journal for other problems too, but um, we work through the math journal and they have this in their math journal. You'll notice, let me switch slides, Let's see if this will go. This is the first problem that we're going to do, and we're going to start with a join result unknown. You'll notice that the problem does not have numbers in it. My favorite thing about these um, word problems within this resource, but within in general, is the ability to take away the numbers. And you can really focus on what is happening in the problem, what is the context of the problem, what are students supposed to understand and take away from the problem. So often, uh, my second graders, and even my seven-year-old son does this, he takes a look at a problem, he looks at the numbers, and just adds them together. In this particular word problem for today, that'll work because it is um, a join problem, but there are other problems for which that won't work as well. So um, my favorite thing to do is take away the numbers so the students don't even understand or can't even see what those numbers are because the numbers get distracting. They are distractible to students and they um, take away from the meaning of the problem sometimes. Um, the numbers are definitely important but I give them to students a little bit farther down the line after we have analyzed the problem and um, worked through the problem a bit. So um, I always start with the problem without any numbers. I've put the problem up at the bottom of the screen. Um, I can make it a little bit bigger, but then it starts cutting off my face, which I don't want to do. So I'm hoping that um, you can see it on the uh, Facebook Live and be able to um, and be able to read it well enough. So the first thing that I do with students at the beginning of the year, if this were a new group of students, is we take a look at a couple of words and I introduce them to these words. The first word is starts. So every word problem that is join or separate has a start to it. So you start someplace in the word problem. Part, part, whole, and compare problems are a little bit different. We don't use the vocabulary which start with them, um, but for join and separate problems, so this week and next week, we'll take a look at the word start. The other word we take a look at is change. Now, start should be a familiar word to students. It is not a new word for them. Hopefully by second grade they know what that means. Change may or may not be a new word, and this will definitely be a new context for it. And the other word that may or may not be new is the word R-E-S-U-L-T. -E I can't spell and talk at the same time. Um, the other word that is result. So there's start, change, and result. And we take a look at those within um, the word problem, and we figure out what the pieces are of the word problem, we, and we write the equation. So as we go through, um, all of the word problems that we do, and I'll do um, one a day with my students, especially at the beginning of the year. Toward the middle and end of the year, we might do like three a week or two a week, depending on um, different activities that we have going on. But it definitely, at the beginning of the year, as we're establishing the routine, or if it's a new routine, we do one every single day. And I'm very consistent about the vocabulary that I use with students, so we always have the word start, change, and result with these problems that we're doing. And so um, we'll go through the problem, we will read the word problem, and then we will label the parts of the problem. Um, start, change, and result. Now, they easily start with different letters, so I will often just use an S, a C, and an R um, within the problem. So with the students, I'll often have a student read the problem. I don't have a student with me right now, so it's just me, um, but I'll read it with you guys. So it starts out, Erica put blank, flakes of fish food in her fish tank before school and blank more when she got home. How many flakes did she put in the tank? And so I will talk with students and will elicit from students um, words that and uh, what in the problem is the start or how does the problem start? And 
We will also talk about something else in the problem that I don't necessarily name up here, but it's a very important part of the problem, and it is the verb in there. So the start of the problem is up here. Erica put blank flicks. That is the start. And this verb right here is put. With kindergarten students, you will often act out these word problems with them, and you'll have a little kid come and put pretend flakes into a bowl, and the idea of putting is what makes this a join problem. When you put something into something, it becomes a join problem, and it puts it together or it joins it together. And so that verb, especially for join and separate problems, is very integral in the problem. It's a, it's a, um, it's a key piece of the problem. So here's the start. Erica put blank flakes of fish into her food, into her fish tank before school. And blank more when she got home. There's the change. How many flakes did she put in the tank? This is your result that you're looking for. You're looking for the total amount. How many uh, flakes are put in the tank? For all of the join problems that we're going to go through this evening, it always is a start plus change equals result. And that's how the problem is set up. Um, you always have the start and you start with something, something changes, and then there's a result. Now, not all of the problems will have this equation with it, and I'll show you what that looks like in the other two join problems, but all the join problems will have um, two things that get put together in order to have a result occur. So. In this case, there will be a number plus another number equals another number. And you can see that um, we talk about how many flakes she put in at the beginning and how many flakes um, she put in when she got home, and that's how many flakes she put in all together. For second graders, these types of problems are, are generally pretty easy to solve. They're familiar to students. They have done them in kindergarten and first grade. And so for my second graders, um, I generally start these toward the beginning of the year. And the blank spaces also provide me an opportunity to differentiate the numbers. So for my students, um, if I were teaching first grade or even kindergarten, I might start with uh, smaller numbers like three and five. With my second graders, um, once I start introducing these problems, I might start with 10 and then, uh, let's see, I don't know, four. Okay. For my higher students, if we are farther along in the year, granted fish are not going to eat this much food in one sitting, but just for the word problem's sake, you might be adding um, two digit numbers together. So you can easily differentiate the numbers based on the ability of the student. And there are often times in my classroom that I will um, give most students one set of numbers, and then I'll quietly walk over to some of my um, RSP kids or my um, kids who have SSTs or my kids who I know are not quite working at that level yet and I'll write down another set of numbers. So we're all working on the same problem and I can do the same whole group instruction with all of my students but I will differentiate the numbers with them. Once we have worked through the problem up here we will uh, put in the numbers into the blank space so let's say we just use 10 and 4. So Erica put in 10 flakes of fish food into the fish tank before school and four more when she got home. How many flakes did she put into the fish tank? And then we build our equation. So the start was 10 flakes and then four more flakes when she got home. So there's a start, there's a change, and then there's a result. I will um, allow students to solve the problem. This will generally be pretty easy for students to solve. And then I have students write down the process that we use um, to solve the problem. We identify the start, the change, and the result in the problem. We um, set up the equation. We often, with higher numbers, will use a model or a strategy to solve the problem. Um, not going to show that to you now just to show you some different problem types, but um, you can use a number line or you can um, use base 10 blocks so you can count on or you can different strategies that kids can use to solve problems. So there's a variety that students can use, um, but I have students um, explain how they solve the problem and then end their writing with a sentence that says, um, Erica put in 14 flakes in this um, 
in this instance, 14 flakes in the shame. So they end it with a complete sentence. And then we move on to um, the rest of our math time, whatever that looks like. So this is a join result unknown problem. I'll put the um, problem back up there so you can take a look at it. And um, just in case it wasn't uh, visible on the bottom of the screen. I start with these problems at the beginning of the year because they are the easiest for students to understand. And students are most likely to have seen them in kindergarten and first grade. Um, when I started using these problems, I taught um, a K-1 combo, no, a 1-2 combo. And so my first graders had seen these problems in kindergarten. And um, it was just a good way to reintroduce them to the problems. And I was able to easily differentiate the numbers between my first and uh, second graders at the time. So I've erased the board and we're going to take a look at another problem of a join problem. Let me grab some water. Alrighty, so the second problem we're going to take a look at is, um, let me see, move this forward, there we go. This one is a join change unknown. So it's um, labeled at the bottom JCU, or join change unknown. And this problem differs a little bit in that um, you are still using a start and a change and a result, except in this time, the change in the problem will be unknown. Now, I don't tell this to students ahead of time. The acronym down here is just for me because I tend to print a lot of these at one time and put them in files and then um, grab them as I need them. But what, um, what it does is uh, give students an idea of how problems can change. Um, so let's take a look at this problem. I can put it up at the bottom of the screen and we will see if, um, again, I'm not 100% sure you can see that. It looks like you can. Um, so we'll take go. We'll move forward from there. In this particular problem, it says Olivia has blank marbles in her collection. Sam gives her his collection of marbles. Now Olivia has blank marbles. How many marbles were in Sam's collection? So you can easily identify, especially as a teacher, but I walk this through with students. Identify the start and the change and the result in the problem. And so we read it with students. And before any numbers go in the problem, we identify where does the problem start? Okay. The problem starts with how many marbles Olivia has in her collection. So there's the start. Now once again, the verb in this problem is, is um, significant because it is a join problem. I will often circle the verbs in, in the problems. This particular one is gives. With younger kids, you have um, a student modeling how to give something to someone else. With my second graders, I just have them take their hands and push away from them because they're giving something to someone else. So they are um, sort of adding to their number or um, you would model it with two kids in this instance because giving could also be um, subtraction depending on the scenario in the problem. Um, I'll try and see if I can remember to grab one of those with the separate problems. But in this instance, it is an addition problem because you're starting with what Olivia had and what Sam gives her. And then you have the result right here for how many um, marbles she has now. And what you're looking for here is how many Sam gives her, and that's your change. How many marbles get added to her collection? How many marbles were, were given to Olivia? And, um, and that is your change in the problem. So again, you're looking for the start plus change equals result. So same uh, equation gets set up. And in this instance, the unknown is the change. So we have numbers for the start and we have numbers for the result, but we don't know how, much, how many marbles were in Sam's collection. So that's what we're going to solve for. And like all of the problems, you can differentiate the numbers and you can um, easily give students different numbers. Let's say this problem was um, a, a, a word problem that I used with students when we were doing two-digit addition subtraction. So I would give students some two-digit numbers. Let's see. Mm, let's see, that won't work. So as you are coming up with numbers, you're also going to want to think about ahead of time. This is where your teacher brain comes in a little bit. Um, think about ahead of time. Um, what numbers can go in the different places. So if you start with 35, 
I was thinking about writing something like 24. You can't end with 24 with this problem because she would have less numbers, less marbles. And so you have to um, be conscious of the problem and how you are, and the numbers you are choosing. So for this one, I might do 76, let's say. And so Olivia has 35 marbles in her collection. Sam gives her his collection of marbles. Now Olivia has 76 marbles. How many marbles were in Sam's collection? This makes the problem a lot more difficult. With younger students, you definitely want to start with one-digit numbers, and maybe you start with 5 and 11. And it makes it easier for students to be able to solve. Definitely use manipulatives with younger students, and even with second graders who may not be able to solve two-digit addition problems yet, use those manipulatives. Um, we would set up the problem with students to look something like this. We have a start, Sam gives her some more, and now she has 76. So now we need to figure out how to get from 35 to 76 to understand how many marbles were in Sam's collection that he gave her. One strategy that I often use with students is a number line. And I would model this with students, or at this point in the year, hopefully they have become um, a little more proficient at, at generating their own number lines and using their own number lines. So it kind of depends on where you are at with students and their um, learning with different models and strategies that, use, that you use with them. But for this particular one, just to give you an example of it, um, this model would be using um, a number line and um, starting at 35. And I know that I have to get to 76 because that's how much um, she had at the end. So here's my start and here's my result within the problem. I love using friendly numbers. So I go to 40, which would be a plus five right there. And then I often count by tens or if I already know how to, I can skip all the way to 70. It's up to you and your students and where they're at. So you can either go 40, 50, 60, 70, or you can go 40 to 70. Either way will get you the same res result. You want to um, always push students to be more efficient in their mathematical thinking. So if students are already able to go by tens, then push them to go all the way to 70. The, um, the, math, the math is still the same in terms of getting the end result, but what you want students to be able to do is to be able to move toward efficiency. So either they are doing plus 10, plus 10, plus 10, or you can do plus 30. Either way, um, but challenge them. Get them to that next level if you can. The next um, piece of this is doing plus 6 right here and then combining it all together. So what this might look like if you were writing it down in equation form, uh, let's see, can you see the bottom? Yeah, you can see the bottom. 35 plus 5 equals 40. 40 plus 30 equals 70. 70 plus 6 equals 76. And then what we are doing is adding these all together here. Um, and so my brain immediately adds the ones together first. So 6 plus 5 is 11. 30 plus 11 is 41. And so I knew that Sam had 41 marbles in his collection. So some of this I would go through with students, um, and it depends on the time of the year, of course, and how far into two-digit edition we are going. Um, if we are pretty far into the year, we go through this part, uh, whole class, and then I say, now go solve it on your own and figure out how to um, come up with the result or the change in this one. So results the wrong answer. The answer, but how much, um, or how many marbles were in Sam's collection. Um, if it is, uh, if the two-digit addition is a new concept for the students, and I'm not quite sure that enough of the class would be proficient in it, then we go through the model and um, some of the addition, and then we, um, I still have them do their writing. This is less writing than I require of students. Um, obviously, I'm not going to write it all out for you right now, and there's you know a lack of board space. So um, I generally write, have them write um, a couple sentences in second grade. This would be appropriate for first grade. Um, in second grade, I have them write a couple sentences talking about the problem, 
how they solved it, and then um, there was the answer that they came up with, and um, working through um, how many marbles were in his collection. So that, again, is this word problem here. No, yes, that word problem there talking about how many marbles were in um, Sam's collection that he had given to someone else. So this is a join change unknown. So what we don't know is how many marbles were in Sam's collection. The last problem that we're going to take a look at is, let's see if I can get that up there, is what's called a join start unknown. And this one I feel like is the most difficult of the join problems. So I've kind of left it for last. But in this one, you don't, what's unknown is the start of the problem. So you're taking a look at um, the the problem type and how um, how the problem begins. So let me switch this out. There you go. And you should see that at the bottom of your screen now. So instead of uh, solving for change, you are now solving for the start of the problem. Again, it's still a join problem. So in this particular problem, take a look at what the verb is in the problem. And if you can identify it, go ahead and type it in the comments down below. Um, what is the verb in the problem? Hmm. There's a couple verbs, but which one is significant for the problem to tell you that it is a join problem? Hmm. Addison has some necklaces. She went shopping and bought more necklaces. And there's a blank. Blank more necklaces. Now she has blank necklaces. How many necklaces did Addison have before she went shopping? So that verb in there is pretty significant. It is the word bought. And when you buy something, you are bringing it into yourself. You are adding it to what you already have. So again, we know it's a join problem because you are buying something and sort of taking it with you, taking it home, putting it into your own uh, repository of, um, of necklaces, I suppose. I don't really have that many necklaces, but just for problem's sake. So again, we go through and we identify the start, the change, and the result in the problem. In this particular problem, Addison had some necklaces. It doesn't tell you how many she had. It just says she had some, and that's where the start is. She went shopping and bought blank more, so that's your change. Often, um, and this can be confused with compare problems as well, but often um, the change will be a more or less in a problem. Uh, but not always, so you don't want to depend on that within problems. But um, it is a, a commonality in problems that the change will be um, more or less word after it. Now she has blank necklaces. Here's your result. That's how many necklaces, necklace, necklaces she now has at the end. So again, your problem uh, is set up the same way where you've got a start plus a change equals a result. So then you would go about um, identifying and giving students numbers in order to solve this problem. And we'll do that in just a second. All of the problems that I've shown you um, today have been join problems. And I put those together because it's really easy just to um, put them all together. When I teach these with students, I'm not so obvious. Um, I do mix up join and separate problems as I'm teaching students. So we'll start out with um, join uh, result unknown, and then we'll go into separate result unknown, which are the two easiest problems and ones that they should have had in earlier grades. Um, and so then I'll mix those up between join and separate. So we're not always adding within our equation. And you want to do that so that they don't, so that students don't get too comfortable with what you're doing, and it really makes them read deeper into the problem. So um, for what I'm showing you here, yes, they're all join problems, but when I do this with students, we mix it up a little bit more, um, just so that they have to read and figure it out. Alrighty. So like all of the problems, there are blank spaces within the problem, and you can differentiate the numbers. So I could say that she went shopping and she bought 10 necklaces, or I can say, I don't know, she went to um, the dollar store and they were really, really cheap and she bought 50 necklaces. Or I could even say maybe she only bought five necklaces. 
So again, you can differentiate the numbers with students and help them um, meet the math where they're at. So depending on the grade level, student ability, you just want to make sure that students can um, solve the problem where they are. So in this particular case, let's see, she went shopping and let's say she bought 15 necklaces. Now she has, again, this is going to be a case where you want to uh, make sure that your result that you put in here is more than your change. Just like in the last problem, you want to make sure your result was more than the start. This one, you want to make sure that it's more than the change so that um, the problem actually makes sense. You're not really teaching students negative numbers and it just wouldn't make sense. Um, the problem wouldn't make sense. So um, just make sure that your result is more. And let's say, um, let's see, we'll do 42 and I'll show you um, how we can solve that, probably using a number line. It's one of my favorite tools. So Addison had some necklaces. She went shopping and bought 15 more necklaces. Now she has 42 necklaces. How many necklaces did Addison have before she went shopping? So students are solving for the start. That is the unknown in the problem. I will often put a box for the start and then um, write in the other numbers. Now, again, depending on the time of the year, I will um, leave it there with students and I'll say go solve the problem. If students are, if it's, we're newer into addition and subtraction and we're still learning how to use the strategies and the models that we've developed, um, I go through it with students and have them um, either copy it down or I'll have my higher students work ahead and uh, I might pull a small group around me and say let's work through this together. It depends on where we are at in the year. Um, but I definitely do this piece with students. Um, maybe toward the end of the year, I do more group work and I have them turn to their partner and determine an equation uh, for, the, for the problem. But oftentimes I will do this part with them. Alrighty, so let's take a look at, um, at this problem. We know that, we sh went, that she went shopping and she bought 15 necklaces and now she has 42. So word problems are great because they are very contextualized. Um, students will have to think about the problem itself in order to figure out how it fits into the model. You'll notice on the join start unknown problem, no, this is a join start unknown, the join change unknown problem, that I had put both the start and the finish, the result on here, because the problem lent itself to it. The problem told us what the start was. In this particular case, the problem is not telling us where the start is, so I'm not putting it on the number line yet because students have to figure out what the start is, and that's where we're going to end up on the number line. The change is 15. That's how many she bought. So what I'm going to do is essentially subtract 15 from 42. Now, um, at this point in the year, we've done a lot with decomposing numbers, and my hope is that students know and can take a look at 15 and say, oh, that 5, there's a 2 and a 3 in that 5, and then I can have a 10 in it. Um, we've done a lot of work with um, decomposing 10s and decomposing 5s and looking at different problems. The reason why um, my hope is that students can do this is because of this number right here. So there's 42 there. So students can subtract that 2 right there, okay? and it gets them to 32, and then they can, um, sorry, let me redo that. It gets them to 40. I was thinking about showing you guys one, another way to do this, which I'll do in a second, but my two uh, number lines merge together in my head. So anyway, you subtract 2, and then you can subtract 10, which would get them to 30, and then you can subtract 3, which would get them to 27. And then she had 27 um, necklaces at the beginning of the problem. And so that would be um, one way to do this number line. The second way uh, to do the number line is very similar, except you, um, let's see, let's do here, 42, is very similar to where I would set it up again with uh, the result on the left, right, right hand side. Um, and instead of decomposing or breaking apart 15 here, I would take a look at 10 and 5 
and decompose it into ones and tens. And so you could subtract 10 first, going down to 32. And then if students can do this in their head, they might do a 3 and a 2, or 2 and a 3, which would get you down to 27. Or some students might even be able to subtract 5 in their head, um, going that way. It's the same concept, it just depends on how, um, how you move down the number line in this case, uh, which one you start with, and uh, whether it's the 10s or the 1s, and how you break apart that 5 to move down it. Alrighty. So, um, and again, I have students go through and write out um, the answer to the problem and write out how they solved the problem within their math journals. So, um, this just gives you an idea of some different problem types for um, join problems, for um, how to solve word problems with join. Uh, let's see, we went through join start unknown, we went through uh, join result unknown and went through join change unknown. If you guys uh, want to find out some more information, um, at the beginning of the Facebook Live, I went through and showed you this blog post that talks about how to solve um, word problems by problem type and how I differentiate them by leaving out the numbers. It'll give you some more information on the start, the change in the result, and how we solve problems that way. You can um, download a free sample of word problems in um, in this post and um, sign up to receive those and it'll go through some um, how we solve them. It'll also look at some models and strategies that we use um, when solving them and you can see some student samples in here as well if you scroll all the way down. The other two um, blog posts that I want to share with you and I'll also share them in the other Facebook lives include um, the reason why I don't teach students to use keywords Early on in my teaching career, I um, made all these cute posters about all the keywords for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division problems, and I really liked the posters. They were great, um, but they didn't really help students solve problems once it came down to um, doing them independently because, you know, the state testing or the testing kids do, it always tries to trick students, and it never, it either doesn't use the keyword or it uses the wrong keyword. Um, so this post goes more in depth about problem types itself and why teaching students to solve word problems by problem types is uh, sort of the best route to go and helps them um, really focus and, um, and it sets them up for success later on, especially as you get into two-digit word problem, two sorry, two-step word problems, or even three-step or multi-step word problems. Being able to um, understand um, what's going on in the word problem um, gives students um, the ability to solve it. And the last post here, which I'll put all these links in here um, in the comments in just a minute. This one is models and strategies for two-digit addition. So you'll notice that I used um, a number line quite often, and that is one of my favorite strategies um, for two-digit or even three-digit addition and subtraction. So it just goes through some different anchor charts that I've created with students for those models and strategies, and then goes through and um, specifically talks about each one. So there's some um, ideas and resources and different ways that students have used them in class and just to give you an idea of the different models and strategies. So um, that's kind of what I have for you today. Uh, feel free to leave any questions in the comments and I'll definitely be sure to um, answer them and get back to you. You can reference those blog posts about um, word problems and keywords and models and strategies and we can um, I will be back next week to show you the separate problems. So I'm going to put all of those together in one Facebook Live and show you how um, those word problems um, can be solved and how they can be modeled. Um, I think that's it. Just let me know if you have any questions. And it was good talking with you here today. And thank you for uh, watching, for coming out and joining me this evening. And I hope you have a great rest of your week, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, take care.